Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Wistia. Take control of your video marketing with powerful tools and analytics built specifically for business. Go to wistia.com slash twist to get your free Wistia account today. And by HostGator, your one-stop shop to getting your business online. Your domain name, your website, your website design, and even your marketing. They've got you covered. Have questions? Their team is there 24-7 via chat, phone, and email to help you. Start today for 30% off with the coupon code TWIST. Hey everybody, as you know, I'm getting obsessed with drones and I believe that drones are actually ready for prime time and that these startups are actually going to become very large important companies in the future. And so we're starting a new podcast called Inside Drones. And this week in startups and inside drones are going to do a couple of crossover episodes in the coming weeks so that you, the This Week in Startups audience, can learn about InsideDrones.com and the Inside Drones app and the Inside Drones podcast. Today, I have a Helen Grainer on the program. She has a $500 drone that has six copter blades, and it is perfectly level when it flies, and she is an absolute genius when it comes to robotics. She was inspired, inspired by R2-D2 when she was 11 years old and saw Star Wars in theaters and became obsessed with uh, droids and robots, and she co-founded iRobot with Rodney Brooks, which of course made the Roomba, which was the, really the first commercial um, co you know, robot in our houses. It just cleaned the floor. Very interesting that they chose that. And now she has a new $500 uh, drone called the Level One from Sci-Fi, and it's on Kickstarter, and it's only $500. It's a revolution in drones, and you're going to hear all about the drone revolution today on This Week in Startups and Inside Drones. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, funny is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like people until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like people until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups slash Inside Drones. Yes, I'm launching a second podcast just about drones, and this is a hybrid episode. It's a crossover episode, like in the Marvel Universe when, like, Spider-Man goes and joins the Avengers, if you will, um, except we have no superpowers. But as you know, This Week in Startups is a show where we talk about startup companies, the future, technology, and basically putting new ideas into the world. And one of the most amazing new ideas out there are drones. Now, drones, um, you may think of military drones when I say the word drones, but actually, quadcopters is really what everybody refers to as drones today. Those are, as you can imagine, um, those little devices that nerds are flying around park and your geeky friends have right now, and they have four copters on them. And they're very powerful and they're very intelligent, and just two or three years ago, they were a complete disaster. They would crash, um, people were getting hurt by them, and the technology, I, in my estimation, being somebody who's covered technology as a journalist and pundit uh, for 25 years, was just not ready for prime time. In fact, I think when you look at the drone space, uh, we're going to look back at this moment in time, 2015, in the same way we look at 1985 for VHS cameras, which is to say you might have an uncle or an aunt or a cousin uh, back in 1985 who had a VHS camera or a Betamax and would come to parties like I did uh, when I was going to my Irish, uh, you know, Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas, all this stuff. And he would take out his camera and he'd say, identify yourself. <laughs> he would yell at you, identify yourself. And you'd have to like say, I'm Jason, I, uh, I'm McCabe Calacanis. And then, he, you know, he would just interrogate you. It was like the Stasi interrogating you or something like that. And you were like, who is this person with a camera? You'd never seen a camera in your life. They were big, they were clunky, they were too expensive, they broke, they were not ready for prime time. But those videos, those amazing videos, if we had only had them 10 years earlier or 20 years <coughs> earlier, we all value those videos that we have from those v first VHS tapes. And now, 95, 2005, 2015, 30 years later, everybody has an HD version of that camcorder, that VHS quarter, Betamax, in their pocket. And when we go to a concert, we have 100 people hold up a VHS camera. In other words, it went from one geeky person out of 100 having one to 100% of people having them. This is what will happen with drones, I predict. This is the year that we look at them and say, hey, they're interesting, they're unique, but it's not the year we're all going to have them. That year is going to come in 10 or 20 years when I believe you won't be able to have a car or a home without a drone built into it in some way. It sounds futuristic. 
We look out on the sky today, we see no drones. We see beautiful blue skies with nothing in the air, except for an occasional helicopter chase if you live in Los Angeles, or you know, uh, jets flying out of SFO going to uh, destinations uh, on the East Coast and to Asia, et cetera. In the future, we're going to look up and we're going to see at least a dozen or two drones right in our proximity humming by. Some people think that's dystopian. Some people think it's inspiring. It's going to be a big debate. It's going to be a big challenge. But just like we got used to cars, we're going to get used to drones. And uh, we've started this adventure of finding every drone company we can and any intelligent person working on it. Um, and many, many roads uh, led to my guest today, Helen Grainer. So welcome to the program, Helen. Oh, thanks so much for having me. When did you start getting into drones? When did you become aware of them for the first time? And then when did you get the bug? Because people who get into these, they seem to become like part of the cult. Yeah, that's so funny because I've been working on robots for decades. I'm one of the co-founders of iRobot that um, uh, made the Roomba vacuuming robot. We all know the Roomba. Yes. And so, this is for people who don't sweep their apartments <laughs> and it just comes out and sweeps their apartment. Does that work, They're the for, Roomba? They work extremely well. They're for everybody because no one should have to spend their time sweeping and vacuuming when it can be automated. But at iRobot, we also did, did some military robots. They saved the lives of hundreds of soldiers and thousands of civilians. So I'm deep into robotics and and, you know, after 18 years, I'd taken iRobot public, and I was looking around at what to do next. I'd been familiar with drones for decades, but as you said, they weren't quite ready for prime time. But I saw in 2008, that's the time to jump in because the capabilities on them are truly, truly tremendous. Compared to the ground robots, um, you know, if you look around a room, even like this, um, up here is free space. Down on the floor, you have to avoid all these obstacles, and it's a very difficult problem. We get to cheat with the drones, and you kind of solve the mobility problem, and you can move on to some of the, you know, even more exciting uh, autonomy aspects. So, um, iRobot, <clears throat> I know Rodney Brooks was part of that. He was mm -hmm. your co-founder. Yeah. And that came out of MIT's uh, robotics lab, or you guys were all in Boston or something? Well, two, the... two of us were grad students at MIT. Ah. Rod was a professor. He kept his day job, and uh -huh. uh, me and uh, Colin Angle went off and uh, started iRobot. And so these, uh, everybody knows the Roomba. Mm -hmm. Just to go down history here and go down memory lane, wh why did you guys, how did you come up with the first robot people are going to have in their house is going to be this little droid that zips around and cleans the floors. Why did you pick that? Well, we were doing lots of robots before that. We had been doing robots for nine years when we started the Roomba development for all kinds of applications, from downhole oil to industrial cleaning to toys and games with Hasbro. Um, but when we came up with the idea to do a Roomba, and then we started building them and um, you know, when we did the analysis, the price point worked, the capabilities worked, the customer focus groups worked, and everything just came together. And it's like, you know, this is going to be the first real autonomous robot. And that's what got us so excited because mm. we're autonomous robot people. So when you saw the first quadcopter in 2008, mm. who had made it? Where did you see it? Because I don't actually know the history of who came up with this idea. I know I've seen the... Um, there's an airplane that vertically lifts with two helicopter mm -hmm. blades on it, and there's obviously helicopters. But when did the first person decide to have four? Because I think, was that the tipping point that you could say this is a quadcopter, this is a drone, as opposed to just a helicopter? Um, it's been going on in the universities. I mean, I remember seeing them in the early 2000s at, yeah. at, at, at universities and probably before that. And the advantage is it gets rid of the swash plate on the helicopter, which can ah. be finicky. Um, that's the blade to, on the back that's horizontal, not the, that's um, vertical, not horizontal. It, it's what it lets you um, change direction on a helicopter ah. by tipping the blade. The quadcopters, they don't tip the blade, they tip the whole vehicle. Ah. So that's with the advantage. They're very easy to control. Mm. Now, we've actually gone beyond that. Right. Um, we've created a, um, a hexacopter that doesn't need to tip to fly. So it's got all the advantages of the helicopter, but the ease of control of the quad rotors. Got it. So it's a hexacopter, which it's means it has seven blades. Six. I'm kidding, six. <laughs> I'm showing how bad I did in math. So it's an octocopter. It has six. No, it has yeah. six blades. So you picked six. 
as opposed to for why? Well, what we've done is we put a dihedral, which is the angle between the uh, base and the uh, rotors, okay. and a twist on each of them. And then with some fancy math running on the inside, you can achieve level flight. And uh -huh. you do need six to do that. But six have so many other advantages. If, um, if we lose a, a, a rotor, six can land. With our level up technology, this robot can keep flying. If it loses one or um, some combination of two rotors in, in, in flight. Ah, so it can actually survive losing an engine, perhaps <laughs> even two. Perhaps even two, depending on which two. <laughs> I was about to say, if two on the same side no, go not out. not these two, but these two. <laughs> if the opposite two go out, you can probably land it. Yeah. Um, so this redundancy um, makes it work. Now, why did quadcopters all of a sudden go from being dangerous and hard to fly to this year I flew the DJI, um, whatever it is, Phantom, whatever, mm -hmm. two, whatever, and then I did the uh, 3DR latest right. one with Chris right. Anderson out in Berkeley, and... Um, Boy, has everything changed, hasn't yeah. it? Like, you used to be, they have to train you in how to use it. Now, when I used it, it's just like up is up, yeah. down is down, left and right spins, right. and forward and back is forward and back. But the, the it just works. Yeah, the tipping point was really uh, the GPS stabilization. Ah. There's a very fast control loop running on these mm -hmm. um, with an IMU system, but the drift on that uh, control loop is bounded with the GPS signal, and that made all the difference because now, instead of always controlling the helicopter, with you know this very fast joystick with twitchy hands, you can just set the robot and it just hovers in place. Ah. Now we've gone even beyond that with this with ease of use. You can control it from a cell phone. You don't need joysticks. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of having this tippy motion, we've been able to um, fly level that allows us to. Um, th instead of having this expensive, fragile gimbal system on mm -hmm. the bottom, which, right. by the way, takes the full brunt of any bad landing. Oh, yeah, that's not uh, fun. This is what always breaks. This is what the hobby stores that fix these things tell me it always breaks. We've been able to pull the camera system ah. into the body, and that makes it much, much more rugged. And now it's more like flying just the, just the camera. So it's like flying a video camera, and you don't need to... Um, you know, a lot of drones, you have to fly the drone and then fly the camera separately. So it's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. This one, you just fly the camera. And because of the level up technology, you have the full degrees of freedom to get, you know, the exact image you want. All right. When we get back from the commercial break, mm -hmm. I want to ask you a crazy question, which is, when I look at that, I've seen people online on the YouTube and whatnot put like a little Star Wars figure in the middle of the... the, the uh, the quadcopter or the hexacopter, hectocopter, hexacopter? What did you say? Hectocop hexacopter. Hexacopter. Um, I want to know when we get back from commercial break when a human being will be sitting in the middle of these and we'll be <laughs> traveling and then when we get back on this week in startup slash inside drive. Hey everybody, let me take a moment to tell you about a product I love and use every day. It's video hosting from Wistia, W I S. TIA, Wistia. It is awesome. And who uses it? MailChimp, Moz, HubSpot, Zendesk, Herman Miller, Sam Adams, and of course, this week in startups. They've got 140,000 customers um, and they are growing like a weed. Now, why do we use it? Well, if we use a free service like YouTube, we have all YouTube's ads and collaterals and garbage and it looks terrible and it's not customizable. So it looks bad and everything that YouTube does is in service of increasing their metrics. Not your metrics. Well, what are your metrics as a business? Well, for me, it's collecting emails. Two, it's having people on my domain, my site, making it look beautiful, not having that ugly thing that comes up at the end of like a YouTube video that shows all the different videos of other people that I don't want to send my users to. I want, when the video ends, for them to watch another episode of This Week in Startups. I can control all of that with Wistia. That's why I use it. And it works perfectly on Facebook and Twitter with the cards, and you, know, you can play it natively on those platforms. It's gorgeous, and it'll give you a ton of support. You want to take control of your video. Video is a huge asset, and you want to do it professionally. The analytics program is amazing. You can see on a user-by-user -user basis how long they're watching and if they rewound and watch a, a section twice, all this kind of great stuff. Um, tons of support, super easy to use. And it's built, uh, a lot of their new tools are built for marketers, so collecting emails and that kind of stuff. And you don't have YouTube or Vimeo doing that kind of stuff. Those platforms have their own goals, which is selling ads and keeping people on their platforms and stealing those users from your platform. 
Start your two-week trial for free on Wistia. Wistia.com slash twist. No credit card is required because they're so confident that you're going to love the service like I do. And you can upload as many videos as you like. Wistia.com slash twist. W-I-S-T-I-A. Wistia.com slash twist. I love the product. I love the team. And it's been fantastic for us. We got control of our own videos again. And we are now collecting emails every day, dozens of emails every week, hundreds of emails every year, thousands of emails to build our direct relationship that is not have an intermediary between it, telling us how we can talk to you, our fans. We have a direct relationship. It's brilliant. I love Wistia. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Uh, my guest today, Helen Grainer, uh, and she is on the Twitter, Helen, G-R-E-I-N-E-R, um, and she is with Sci-Fi Works, which is C-Y-P-H-Y, works.com, and she has made uh, a drone with six blades, hexacopter, Hexa, hexacopter. 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 Amazing. Um, now, how much? You, you put this on Kickstarter. Yes. I'm going to get back to the question about, uh, you know, if, when humans are going to fly this. But you put this on Kickstarter just a couple of weeks ago or days mm -hmm. ago. It's done phenomenal. So 14 days, a half million dollars. Yes, we exceeded our, you know, initial Doubled goal it. within, um, you know, the first four days, which was great. What's that like as, a, as an entrepreneur? Because you're a serial entrepreneur and technologist. What's it like when you just see the cash register ringing like that in advance when compared to, say, iRobot, where you had to raise tens of millions of dollars in capital, I believe, you know, it, to get the product into stores? It, it's wonderful. Uh, by the way, we, we were not able to raise tens of millions of dollars for Moomba at the time because all the venture capitalists were like, oh, it's a consumer product. You know, Are people mm. really going to have a robot in their homes? Blah, blah, yeah. blah. Um, so the old way to do things was, you know, you throw the engineers in the back room, you feed them once in a while, and two years later, they put a product on the market and you hope for the best. With the crowdfunding and Kickstarter, you're able to get that um, initial feedback on your idea, but beyond that, you've got a community of support that we intend to ask any questions. So we've got the basic design done, but there's going to be a myriad of design decisions along the way. And we have right. we have our peeps now. Yeah, who are going to like be your early adopters and advocates. Oh, they're wonderful. What's the cost on this? This is uh, $4.95. $4.95? Yeah. yeah. Now, wait a second. I just talked to Chris Anderson. He mm -hmm. said his new one's like a, a grand or something. And the 3DR now came out with a $1,000 one. You cut that in half. I'm assuming um, more, more than half because by the time you put on a camera and a gimbal uh, system, mm. the 3DR this one comes with a camera for eighteen hundred dollars. Oh, so this comes with a camera that and comes everything with that little Sony need. camera. And the trick is we've got yeah. rid of this gimbal because we're able to fly level. A lot of what the gimbal's doing is compensating. You know, the robot tilts, tilts this way to fly, and the gimbal system moves your camera back. Uh, and we've got rid of that with some mm. very very clever uh, engineering. So this is very interesting because I was writing about why I think drones are going to happen. I just said the fact that it hit a $1,000 price point and mm. it's hard to crash them now. 500 is the right price point. And yeah. I was like, I felt like 1000 yeah. was the first real price point for what I call prosumers. Yeah, but yeah. 500 is... is consumer. Yeah, you're starting to get down to consumer level now. Yeah, and that's VHS costs 500 really bucks. exciting because that's the price point you don't really have to ask your significant other if it's okay. Yes. You can just go out and buy it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So now let's not forget my question here, which is... Um, I know this sounds crazy, but I have seen some people <clears throat> online building large quadcopters, um, and there are people who are making ones that have eight blades or 12 blades. In your estimation, <clears throat> as an expert in the field of robotics for over two decades, I believe, <clears throat> what, maybe three, I don't know, uh, w will this ever happen in our lifetime? Are we going to be flying in these? Are these meant well, for humans to fly in? Or My experience is the right thing to do with robots is to start small and, and build up. Sure. Like we were building large cleaning robots at, uh, at iRobot before the Roomba, and you know, we started thinking, well, it's probably not the first thing to do. Let's get all the technology working on the small scale ah. and then build up. So I think this is the right approach to get to that, um, you know, human transport uh, yeah. uh, s system. And the level up technology, because you really want to fly flat when you have humans in it. Sure. Just like a helicopter would. You don't want to tip. Great. You don't want to be tipping all the time. Right. Not good for people with motion sickness like myself. Not, me or too. safety. <laughs> yeah. um, so... You didn't answer the question exactly, though, which is, when am I going to be sitting in one of those? When's a human going to actually sit in one of these? Because it feels to me like the battery power is an issue mm. that it would take to lift a human, but then if it works on a small scale, we've seen that movie before, if it works on a small scale, and that's how helicopters started, right? They were mm. building miniature ones, and then all of a sudden somebody got in one. Mm -hmm. So uh, 10 years, you think? 20 I years? 
When if, will if somebody I had fly to one? guess, yeah, I, I, I would guess. go tw- 20 years and all the technologies that were, you know, the level up technology, uh, sense and avoid technology, hmm. um, automated landing, these are all things that we're working on today and they're all going to feed into that. To start to build one today, I think maybe a little bit ahead of their time. Right. If they built them today, it wouldn't work. Why? What would be the big challenges today? Like if you were looking at it and analyzing it as an expert, what would you say is like these are the top three problems in order of humans being in, uh, being in a quadcopter? Um, well, I, I would say the, the first is just um, the size it would have to be. And, yeah. and you know, that's a lot of uh, high-speed spinning <laughs> uh, ah, blades. So You'd have to have some, you know, you have to have some real safety systems in place and you know helicopters have landing pads where i assume you'd want your personal transport to land in your uh front yard, in, backyard. In your front yard. so yeah. um I, th- I think you're gonna have to really think about safety think about safety first <laughs> right the blades are crazy because you have the blades on the same level as the humans not far from them helicopters yeah. are pretty yeah. dangerous that way too but is energy a problem what, what is the energy problem to get solved because you have batteries <clears> have a certain density and with that density, there's a fixed amount of weight. Yeah, yeah. And so there seems to be some weight to energy ratio right. that makes it 15 minutes, 20 minutes of flying time with these? For these, yes. Um, now, we have a line of commercial robots that use tether systems. So we're supplying the power from the ground. Oh, and really? so if you want to have a uh, an eye in the sky long term, like a near Earth satellite system, mm. we, we're f- flying one that's 500 feet up and it, it operates 24 7. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Who, who's doing that? MIT? Uh, we, or? No, no, we're doing it. Oh, you're. We already doing have it. these. Yeah, we 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 have a commercial drone company that uh-huh. has put. We had we developed this great technology um, for the commercial robots, and we looked at each other and said, "All of our pilot, all of our drone pilot wants to fly this, so mm. we should." You know, we should get ah. this out there. So it was because of this technology development that we put a, a Kickstarter out. And so the the role of GPS in all of this, mm-hmm. to me, is a little bit confusing because GPS is, what is it good for now, five feet maybe? How, how accurate is it? And because when, you you know, when you're doing GPS on your phone, it's mm-hmm. not exactly super accurate. Right. It's down to 10 feet or five feet right. or something. So, um, you know, it's 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 actually 15 feet in either direction, right. but it doesn't normally jump uh, jump that much. Right. It's usually pretty stable in mm. the local time area. So, right. um, you know, these things can hover, um, you know, within a foot or two, uh-huh. and it's really, um, you know, that has made all the difference because you no longer have to have your hands on the controls all the time, mm. um, closing that loop. It's um, it's done automatically with the GPS system. Now, GPS is capable of doing much more finite, precise location is my understanding, mm-hmm. but it's not available to the public. But the government, I don't know what your clearance is and all of this, but it can become, GPS has the potential to be down to the inches. Is that correct from what I hear? Um, they, they used to have selective uh, availability running, but they've, they've turned that off. So we have a pretty good GPS signal today. The way mm. to get more accuracy is to um, have a differential station. If okay. you have a differential station, you get very, very precise accuracy What on is a GPS. differential station? That's the first time I'm hearing it's that. It's basically term. you have two GPS systems running, and ah. one's on the ground, and so you know it's not moving. So from that, you can figure out what's happening ah. with the one flying. So the GPS system that we all use <coughs> here in the United States, this is the government's GPS GPS system that's been opened up the militaries for commercial use. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Now, is there an equivalent one? Is, is there a name for that one, the government's GPS system? Or just we, call it, we just call it the GPS system. The GPS system that the government yeah. provided. Yeah. And at some point, somebody in the government said, make this yeah. available to everybody. Yeah. But other countries have, uh, Russians have one. Right. Um, and you can use a signal from that as well in the, in, in, in the drones. And you basically, the more satellites you have, the more accuracy your signal. Now, is there a global or a national ground system? You called it a... Um, uh, no, no, you would have a uh, just a, a GPS sitting on the ground, ah. and you um, transmit the uh, differential corrections to your okay. um, drone. Okay, so th- this would be like an individual would put yeah. one on the you ground. You basically put another one on the ground. Yeah, because I was wondering if, why isn't but, there a blanketed, like every square mile of the oh, yeah. United States, a GPS plugged into the ground, powered by the government, that creates a grid to create the differential well, system for all uses at all times. They used to have something like that for coastal areas, the land system, ah. but the GPS has really taken the place because it's global. It's so good you enough. can use yeah. it pretty much everywhere except um, near um, 
uh, shadows of uh, buildings and stuff, which where it gets occluded under bridges, um, places like that. Okay. When we get back from this commercial break, I want to talk about the regulations that have recently um, been um, approved and what you think of them, if they're fair, if they're unfair, and what impact regulation is going to have on the drone market uh, here in the United States when we get back on this week in startups. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to tell you about HostGator. Stop thinking about the business you want to do and just start doing it. Yes, it is the first step for web hosting and domain names. Go to HostGator.com, and it's a one-stop shop for everything you need. WordPress installs, drag-and-drop builders, easily set up custom email addresses, and do in-house design, SEO, and pay-per-click services. Um, and it all starts at like $4 a month hosted. It's incredible with uh, VPS and dedicated service, 24-7 uh, support, 365 days a year. And we use it here at This Week in Startups because it's super, super affordable, especially compared to some of those hosting options, which have gotten very expensive for us. And we were able to uh, use HostGator to save literally thousands and thousands of dollars a month of my money. This is kind of important. And HostGator is saving me, Jason Calacanis, thousands of dollars a month, which I appreciate. Um, the first hundred This Week in Startups listeners um, can sign up using the promo code TWIST25, and they will get a one-year uh, HostGator hatchling package for just $25. Yes, that's the one year of HostGator hatchling package for just $25 if you use Twist25, and that includes unlimited disk space, bandwidth, unlimited MySQL databases, unlimited email accounts. I mean, everything's unlimited at this place, and it's super affordable. And don't worry if you're not one of the first 100. You can still save 30% using the promo code TWIST. So you have two promo codes there. Try the TWIST25, and if not, use TWIST, and you're going to get a great deal. Welcome to the This Week in Startups family, HostGator. We really appreciate the support you've been giving us and the technical team, Jacob and Jackie, um, as we continue to scale our business and our expenses got very expensive and we, hey, we decided we would uh, shop it around and see if we could find a good deal. And HostGator was an amazing deal. Again, we're saving thousands a month and you can start for as little as, gosh, a couple dollars a month. It's a really great service. Go ahead and check out HostGator.com and thank them on Twitter. Welcome to the family, HostGator. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startup slash Inside Drones. Yes, I'm launching another podcast um, to be in sync with the InsideDrones.com website and the Inside Drones app. If you go into the app store and you just type Inside Drones, you can find it. Uh, my guest today, Helen Grainier, um, and, Grainer, sorry, um, and uh, she uh, is the co-founder. You're also the CEO. What is your title? Over at co-founder and CEO. Mm -hmm. There you go, co-founder and CEO. You guys got to get co-founder right because there's always a co-founder somewhere. That's oh, I'm not sorry. A... I meant founder and CEO. I was co-founder of well, iRobot. You're just sorry, the founder of this that. one. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's uh, SciFiWorks.com. Since 2008, of course, she uh, co-founded with Rodney Brooks uh, iRobot uh, in 1994. Um, 1990. 1990. Wow. Isn't that amazing that you're yeah. doing that then? <laughs> So eight, eighteen year overnight success. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, another eighteen year uh, overnight success. So uh, everybody, go visit Kickstarter. You can go buy this uh, sci-fi level one drone. Uh, there's fourteen more days or so. Maybe at the time we tape that we release this, it'll be ten. Um, you doubled the goal of two fifty. You're at over a half million dollars, which means you had a thousand people buy the drone or so. Just about a thousand now. Wow. Yeah. It's so mind blowing. Congratulations. And do you? Is there any profit margin in that, or is it just like that? You just want to get this out there for the public, like, because it seems to me like five hundred dollars, not much margin left, is there? Well, these are going to um, retail for over six hundred dollars, so it's a really good deal while we're on the Kickstarter. You want to get in now? Um, we've been able to bring the price down, you know, as I mentioned, because yeah. we've gotten the gimbals are very expensive, ah. and the independent camera systems are sure. very expensive. The GoPro so when you, systems and everything. Yeah, when you build a camera module in, you get the yeah. same quality. We're doing ten eighty p. That's that um, new Sony one. Rate. That's like a GoPro competitor that you have in there? Uh, yes. Well, we, we just put this one in for the Kickstarter prototype. We're taking a camera module and embedding it in so it'll be more integrated into oh, the design. Oh, so it'll be built in. Yes. But it does have, um, it does look out forward and mm. it does tilt down to look down. Great. 
So Sony's bummed that they're not going to be the default in there, but maybe they provide the component. That module might be. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they'll have the components in there. I mean, this, and now GoPro is going to come out with their own. I hear GoPro now is finally. Yes. But I, we know they've already said it's a quad rotor, so I know that they will not have the features we have and just yeah. be able to simply fly right. the camera system. But right. that's not the only feature we have. We um, we do real-time social sharing because I, you know, yes. I think drone flying is a very social activity, but sometimes you go out alone and what you want to do, just like your camera, you you immediately share that stunning shot, or if your kid just does something cool, like score a goal, you yeah, immediately just... share that. So we support that. And one thing that we've got amazing feedback on so far is our geofencing technology. Hmm. So explain what geofencing yeah. is for people who don't know. They can infer yeah. what it means, yeah. but explain what it means. So. Um, a lot of drones, you have to um, select waypoints in your phone and do correspondence of that to the real world. What we do is we just allow the user to walk their phone around the perimeter of ah. um, where they want the drone to stay, and the drone will stay in that. So if you're a little intimidated to take that first flight, um, you know you, you know the drone is going to stay exactly where you tell it to with a very, very intuitive uh, interface. So you read on the internet, some people, they lose their drone in a tree, or it yeah. goes into the neighbor's yard, or goes into traffic the first flight. Yeah, the neighbors always appreciate that, yeah. I understand. <laughs> so we've solved that problem with the simple interface to the geofence. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can take your phone and walk around the perimeter mm -hmm. of your yard. Mm -hmm. Let's say you had an acre yard, you lived in the country or whatever, in the suburbs. You walk around with your phone. Yep. Now you've created the fence, mm -hmm. the geolocated fence, the geofence. And now when you fly your next mission, when you get up to the edge and you try to fly past it, it the drone just stops. Up. Exactly. It's sort of like in RoboCop where the prime directive is like, don't kill any humans in the... If the RoboCop <laughs> tries to kill somebody, he can't uh, kill anybody. I would think of uh, Asimov when you yeah. talk about the, the robots. The, the those, laws uh, of the laws robot, iRobot. Yes. Now, wait a second. There was a film called iRobot. There was, yes. <laughs> and Asimov had written that story. Yes. And you made a company called iRobot. How mm. the heck did that trademark work? Did you have to get Asimov to... Uh, well, it turns out the um, titles of books are not part of the copyright. Oh. And also, we're using it in a very different domain. Right. It actually came from an internet-connected robot that we ah. were building, became the company name. But I think it's a great name yeah. for a robot company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about the regulation. Mm -hmm. What's the regulation like today? Because we just had, I guess, some <laughs> rules come out from the FAA right. about how high you can fly, where you can fly, but you don't need to have a pilot's license, but there's right. no commercial use, but maybe some people are being approved for commercial use. I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion about the yeah. rules, so I'm going to take recreational use. Yes. There's some guidelines in place. Okay. You can find them very easily on Know Before You Fly. They're very simple. Don't fly near an airport within five miles. That makes sense. Don't fly a greater than 400 feet and fly... Um, not over people and fly safely. And, you know, mm -hmm. with that, you're good to go. It's perfectly legal to fly unless you're in a no-fly zone like a national park. <laughs> yeah. So how high can a, the average drone go today? How high will yours go if you were to break the law or be on your own private property and want to go really high? Um, it doesn't matter whether you're on your own private property, right? oh, it because doesn't. the FAA controls the airspace of the Got entire it. country, down to the ground, by the way. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, so 400 is the limit. 400 is the recreational limit. limit. For commercial, the FAA just put out a, uh, a set of proposed rules. And these are the rules that will come into effect probably early 2017 because they have to go through this long bureaucratic um, process before they do. Mm. Uh, but the rules are basically 500 feet um, fly in the day, don't fly near airports, and you're able to now get an exemption from, for, from those rules for the short, shorter term. So you can fly commercially today for the first time by right. getting what they call a 333 exemption. And you get that exemption and say, hey, I want to I do a wedding or I'm going to do the new Apple campus or whatever. You, you would get it um, not for the specific mission, but for your company Got to fly a specific drone. Which means you're probably going to have to have insurance and you're going to have to be trained. Is yeah. there going to eventually be a license that you're going to have to be, have a pilot's license? For commercial operations, not a um, pilot's license. And we thought the FAA might do that, and we were all very excited. What they said is there will be a drone pilot certificate. Ah. And when these rules open up, so you don't have to fly in an exemption. You can just go and fly commercially. Mm. Um, you'll be able to do it with a drone pilot's certificate. It is pretty impressive, I have to say, at how quickly they're getting these regulations out there. <laughs> 
Um, I, although for you, it must seem very slow. <laughs> it's been decades. It's been decades. Yeah. The yeah. industry has been around for decades. There's been drones, small well, drones for around a decade, for decades. Right. Decades. Really? I've decades. Seen, I was going to robot shows hmm. in the 90s, and there were a lot of drone companies, and they were all restricted from flying, and they could only fly, um, mm. you know, for the, for, for the military, which usually operate either overseas or mm. in restricted airspace. Now, I was with somebody, and we were over at Fort Mason during the launch festival, a conference I host, and somebody took one of those DJIs, and they flew it almost out to Alcatraz, <laughs> and they tried to fly it to the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a pretty far thing, and it went so far away from us, we couldn't see it, and it went so high that mm -hmm. I, it had to be over 400 feet. This person was probably you know, bending some mm -hmm. laws. You, it has to be in sight. But these things are capable of going much higher than 400 feet and Absolutely. much further than sight. How far can the current technology go in terms of height and distance away from well, the Well, it, it really depends on the um, transmission system, the radio transmission Got system. It. And uh, we build in homing behavior. So if you go outside of the yes. uh, radio communication system, you're not getting a signal anymore. The robot automatically comes back to where it started, which yeah. is a fail-safe in, in case you... Um, you know, you, you 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 can't see it anymore, or you uh, you get confused about which direction it's pointing. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing I was very um, impressed by with the DJI unit, which was there was a kill switch, mm -hmm. and there was when it went out of distance and I was right. flying it, it was like lost connection, right, right. coming home. So all the drones do that. Yeah. To, to today. <laughs> it's a very cool feature. Yes. And then when you try to come down mm -hmm. with the um, drone, it used to be that when you push it down it would go straight down as fast as it could. Mm -hmm. But now when you push it down, it knows where the ground is, and it kind of right, slowly right. descends. So you can't knock, you can't land it and smash it on somebody's head. Right. Ours does an automatic um, takeoff and an automatic landing behavior, so you don't have to control it in that difficult region to it, as it hits the ground. Yeah. And it uses its onboard sensors to detect that it's landed. Um, how did you get started in robots? What was the first robot you saw in your life? Like, was there a moment in time you were like, I love robots? Because that's pretty unique. Well, I saw Star Wars when I was 11. Okay. Uh, on the big screen. 1977. <laughs> yeah, 1977. So I was seven years old. So you're four years old when you were born in yeah. 1966 then. You were born in 66 or 65? 67? 67. 67. Yep. I was born in 70. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars was mind blowing, wasn't it? It was wonderful, and I was not enthralled by, you know, Han Solo or Luke Skywalker or Princess Leia. I really was enthralled with R two D two because he had an agenda, he had a personality, and he was really more than a machine. So I wanted to build um, machines that are more than machines. And I think we got a little close, right? Uh, the Roomba has a personality; it bleeps and bloops to tell you what it's doing. Mm. Um, the, uh, you know, the PackBot has been out there saving lives like R2-D2. And now these drones, uh, you know, we did learn in the um, early episodes that R2-D2 actually had jetpacks and was a drone himself. Right. That's right. Yeah. He actually had the ability so to fly. So that's how he got around on stairs and on, uh, yeah, you know, in really the jungle. Yeah, tell us about that until the prequels. Yeah, exactly. You must be super excited about Star Wars Episode Seven. You saw the trailer, I take it. I am I'm very, very excited, yes. <laughs> when you saw that trailer... And I'm sorry to geek out because mm. people who are now millennials who are watching this have no idea what 40-year-olds feel yeah. when they <laughs> see a Star Wars trailer. I, st I literally had this moment when I'm watching the trailer when I mm. realized I was smiling so much I was almost crying mm. in joy yeah, yeah. when I saw the Star Destroyer in the sand yeah. crashed. <laughs> Did you have that same experience? I, um, like it, was more the robots, it was more, more the droids for, <laughs> for, for, for me, honestly. So I'll always have this visceral attachment to R2-D2, but I know the new generation will the like sphere the, that's uh, rolling. the round robot. Yes. The round robot is amazing. I forgot his name. Was that, like, Emmy award winning producer Jackie is going to look up the uh, the name of that drone. But they're going to sell that. I mean, as a robotics person, the Sphero, I remember mm -hmm. seeing the Sphero five years ago. Pretty cool. It's pretty, Impressive. Cool. it's pretty cool, but I think from a mobility standpoint, the drones have it, and that's why I jumped from ground robots into the drone space. All right, let's talk about the dystopian nature of the skies being filled with drones that some people fear. Dystopian nature? I'm going to get my packages in 30 minutes? I am so excited, <laughs> and I believe that my company is going to be the one that um, brings it to you. <laughs> you do? I so do. do you have a relationship with Amazon? Um, I can tell from the length of that pause, the answer is yes, you don't need to continue. <laughs> Um, you you would be under NDA if you did, I bet. Um, I just believe in the space, ah. right? We have um, 
a wonderful technology. We run our, our, our commercial drones 24-7 mm. while flying. Yeah. They're powered from the ground, and of course, we won't be using tethers for that application, but what we will be Are using... Are you the person doing the Amazon is, one? No, no. no uh, okay. What we will be using is a design called a, uh, uh, a tilt rotor. So you put the package into the body of the uh -huh. uh, device, and it acts like these um, v, these um, quad rotors, when, uh, hex rotors, when it's at the fulfillment center, it goes straight up. But then it has fixed, it has wings when it's going to oh, the place wow. where. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the Vertical. hovering stability uh -huh. to do the package drop off and the um, takeoff, and you have the range from the from the wings. Mm. So that is like the is that called the Osprey? What is the one yes, in the it's military? Yes, it's, 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 it's like a smaller um, version of that, but with the package delivery integrated into it. Right. See, see, I was talking to somebody on the inside about this Amazon project, and I was calling, you know, a little bit of BS on it, because I was like, you know what? This has got to be just marketing and PR. No. <laughs> and because where are they going to land the packages? Most people live in cities now. It's urban. It doesn't work. Right. And the person said, uh, actually, there's a solution for it. And I said, what are they going to do, like cut out windows in apartments and have mm -hmm. it land on like the eighth floor? There'll be like a deck for package drivers. Like, nope, but close. And he said, on the roof of buildings, mm -hmm. what they're testing in secret at Amazon is putting a cage on the roof of buildings. Mm -hmm. Then when the drones come, they land inside the cage. Mm -hmm. Then they leave. When they land and they drop the package off, you get a notification that it was just dropped right. off. Obviously, that's easy to do. Now you get a notification on your phone. Hey, you know, your prescription, you know, for your medicine is upstairs mm -hmm. and it's been dropped off mm -hmm. and it's in the cage. You go up to the cage, the cage knows who's you, who mm -hmm. you are from your phone. Yeah, yeah. It allows you to open the cage because you have your, small, your smartphone. Yeah. And it, the cage is open because it knows there's no drone inside. Mm -hmm. You go in, you get your package so it doesn't land on you. Mm -hmm. You get out, it knows the gate closed, now it's ready to drop another one in there. That's how it's going to work, isn't it? That's how it's going to work. Um, and and I, I do believe we can also land uh, in the suburban areas because you can pick where you want the package dropped off on your a satellite system. Mm. And the drone can use its visual system to map exactly where you selected you want, if you want on your driveway or your lawn or your back porch. Or your roof. We'll be able to get it. Or your roof if you, uh, if so you want. So <laughs> I'm going to have them drop it off on the trampoline. <laughs> that's and a good idea. To, that's just a good to be idea. a jerk. <laughs> oh, watch the thing about it. But you'll literally be able to draw. That's fascinating. So you'll go on Amazon you'll, or you'll be on like, you know, whatever pharmacy and you'll be like, oh, yeah, yep. I need to get my prescription yep. dropped off yep. uh, for my, because I have a cold. I need my uh, uh, Z pack. And it will literally say, draw on your lawn where you want it. Mm -hmm. And you'll draw it. And it will come to that exact right place and within I, three or four feet. We'll be winching it down. We won't be landing the, the drone. So um, we will be able to land it on your trampoline. Oh, you'll be winching it down. Yeah. So yeah. you'll say drop the package yeah. down on a on right. a cable. Right. And you'll use visual analytics to make sure there's no people around, no yeah, pet dogs around. Yeah, but it's going to be around. a limit of like one pound per box. No, five pounds, shoebox um, size payload going a distance of 10 miles uh, or within the realms of co even covenant battery technology. We don't even have to wait for battery advances. Because you're not using the quads at all times. You're exactly. doing the gliding. Exactly. Do you realize how insane this is? It's not insane. It's wonderful. I mean, Helen, you know, I like to say we didn't have the internet 25 <laughs> years ago for all intents and purposes. We didn't have a web browser. <laughs> and now we're talking about 10 miles away. Well, the shortest distance between any two points is as the drone flies. Yes. And so it makes sense. Um, you know, you can get your packages in a few days, even overnight today in many areas. Yeah. It makes sense that instant gratification. Consumers want what they want now, and the drones will it's allow incredible. them to get them. Now, what about this dystopian thing like, oh, my God, the skies are going to be filled with these things? How many of these can will be operating in the skies ultimately at the oh. end of our lifetime, 20, 30 years from now? Are we going to look up and all we see are these little, like, birds, and I then we realize they're not birds, they're drones, or we're going to see, like, one or two in the sky and there'll be some limit to them? Yeah, so I don't, I don't believe it's uh, dystopian. I mean, yeah. you know, you get a few packages every day, but it, you know... It's a really, really big space up in the, in the uh, sky. Up, I mean, the sky, and we're not limited like to a particular road. We can be uh, spread anywhere. out. So, um, these things are reasonably small. Nobody worries. You know, there's helicopters, traffic helicopters, police helicopters that fly over cities every day. No one pays them any mind. And the drones will be the same way. You can't hear these things when they're up above 200 feet, and they'll be flying probably at 400 or 500 feet. 
Yeah. You, you can barely see them when they're up that high. No, you're just like a little speck in the sky. Yeah, yeah. And the, the safety of them has gotten at least 10 times safer. Well, in another 10 years, how safe will these be? Will you be able to knock them out of the sky, or are they going to be like these new self-driving cars where I think the self-driving cars are reporting like three accidents per million miles, yeah. and none of them are their fault? Yeah, yeah. Like, literally, they have a perfect driving record, these cars. Think, you know, the industry has to get there, and um, you know, it wouldn't be a legal application today, but I think when we show the FAA that um, we have the safety, we have the sense and avoid technology. We're hooked up to the ADSB, which is a, glo a, a global positioning system that mm. uh, planes use. The FAA is requiring all manned planes to have that system on board uh, by 2020. What's the name of that system again? Uh, a ADSB. ADSB. Yeah. yeah. And that is so every so plane is located. They know where they are, yeah. and they have a receiver, and they know where another plane is automatically without you know, having to see them, which is right. quite, quite hard sometimes. Yeah. Because uh, they're <laughs> there spots fog. and they, yeah. you know, they approach fast. And where the drones are going to make use of that same uh, system. Right. So they'll all be self-aware. They can't crash into each other in that case. And when th th these they'll, they'll know where they are. And we'll just stay far enough away that it won't be an issue. Mm -hmm. Now, when we, um, when planes have that system in it already, when you get close, because some of them have it, it just tells you there's a plane very close to you. Yeah. And then there's a standard for like, you know, whichever plane's going this direction dives, whichever plane's going this direction mm -hmm. goes up, kind of a system. They won't be able to crash into each other. It'll be like an impossibility for well, them to crash into each other. It, it won't be an impossibility, but we'll have rules in place that they, they'll stay far enough away from each other. Mm. I, I believe we will be adding redundancy and add what we call a sense and avoid system mm. on board at the same time. You keep bringing that up. Yeah. Now, that is not using the GPS, not using this um, beaconing yeah. technology. It'd, it'd be using onboard um, sensors. Right. And the first applications for it are not going to be drone delivery. They're going to be for, um, you know, the hobbyists that want to go out and inspect their gutters, just keep them from being able to crash into a tree, crash into right. uh, their, their house, um, hit a person. Now, will those be LIDAR, like <clears throat> lasers doing it, or it'll be computer imaging and the video will just know that's a tree or you're getting close to something? H how are you going to know the distance between the drone and a tree? I think the jury's still out on what technologies. Lasers have been very successful on the ground robot. Radar works really well on, uh, on you know, on, on, on planes. Um, but I think it will be needing a system that flies level like ours because if you tilt, you tilt yeah. all the sensors. So this right. creates a nice stable base for mm. those sense and avoid systems, which is one of the reasons we're so excited because it's not just for today and the visual systems, but for the next generation of sense and avoid. Okay, so you're talking about this Kickstarter project mm. here um, for the level one drone. Um, can I fly that? Yeah, let's all right, do let's it. Go, let's go fly. Yeah, you have we'll to be... see this fly. <laughs> yeah, have we to have see to see it fly. fly. So when we get back, uh, we'll tease this a bunch, but hey, we're actually going to fly the... Uh, sci-fi level one when we get back on Inside Drone slash This Week in Startups crossover episode. Hey everybody, as promised, I'm here with Helen Grainer and we are going to fly the level one by sci-fi. Yep, the sci-fi level one. That's it. It's now on Kickstarter. It's only 500 bucks. No gimbal, but includes a built-in uh, camera. And it's got six rotors, which makes it a hexacopter. Mm -hmm. Hexacopter? Hexacopter, yes. Hexacopter, not a quadcopter. And so if one of those dies, it can still fly. Yes. And the great thing is it doesn't need that expensive, fragile gimbal because we've designed it so it flies level. So you don't flies have to level. compensate for all this motion. And that's what we want to show you today. Okay, great. Let's do it. And that gimbal on the bottom that you see on a lot of the other mm -hmm. ones, it, it's done to stabilize the camera, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it adds all this complexity to the drone. Right and cost. And it takes the full brunt of any bad landing that you yes. have because it's on the bottom. Right. Which, and I, you know what I find is when I first started learning how to fly a drone, when it was wobbling like that, that's when I got nervous. Right, right. That's when I was like overcompensating and going too right, fast, right. too far, pulling back. So it just feels right. with this hexacopter that it's much more stable. Yeah. So it's an excellent drone to start with. But right. if you like and you want to go out and fly acrobatics, you can turn off the level up behavior ah. and you can fly like any other um, quadcopter. But we think most people will stay in this mode because most people will just want to get stunning camera images and that you do it with a nice stable platform. Well, you know, this revolution is um, truly inspiring. And I think for the rest of us, we're actually catching up on the decades of work you've done from seeing R2D2 when you were 11 years old to now uh, and then to founding iRobot and the Roomba 
and now this. Um, everybody, please, uh, well, thanks, Helen, for coming Thank on the you. show. And uh, everybody, go buy one of these. It's only $500. I am telling you right now, uh, this is the year that the drones, I think, are ready for prime time. And $500, I mean, just on a flyer, buy one. I mean, it's, it's support the future and support the innovators who are actually making the future uh, that much better for the rest of us. This is really going to be a great revolution. Thank you so much oh, for coming on the program. So it's a pleasure. We'll see you next time.